Welcome, friends, to Mini Myths from Athena to Zeus by the Hellenic Museum. Here we tell the myths and legends of the ancient Greeks in the same way they would have heard them thousands of years ago, through voice and song. Now, let's dive into the story. Today we sing the song of Perseus and Medusa. Let's journey together back to the story of Perseus, the son of Zeus and Princess Danae of the Argolid. Perseus had promised to give his king the head of Medusa, the monstrous gorgon with snakes for hair that turned anyone that looked at her to stone. Perseus had just met the gods Hermes and Athena, and Hermes had told him the secret way to find the gifts he needed to complete his quest. After their long flight over the ocean, Perseus, Athena and Hermes landed in the Twilight Land, where no ray of sun or moonlight ever touched the sky and began their journey to the Cave of the Grey Women. The three sisters, named Enyo, Pemfrido, and Dino, were born old. They were so old and withered, with grey hair and grey skin and grey personalities, that people had long forgotten their real names and simply called them the Grey Women. Between the three of them, they had just one eye and one tooth which they passed around to each other to see and eat. During their long flight over the ocean, Hermes said to Perseus, Once we reach the house of the Grey Women, stay hidden and still. You'll need a god's precision. When one removes the eye and holds it in their hand, pluck it away quickly and make your demands. Tell them you need to know the way forth to Hyperborea to see the nymphs of the north. They won't refuse. It's a foolproof plan. We'll be on our way soon to that sweet sunny land. Perseus found the grey women sitting in a circle at the mouth of a great frozen cave. He turned to grin at Hermes, but he realised that the two gods had vanished from his side. Perseus saw one of the sisters reach for the eyeball stuck in her forehead. He held his breath, waited for her to pull it out, and snatched the eyeball out of her hand. It took the grey women a few moments to realise that none of them had the eyeball. Sister, did you drop it? No, sister, I didn't. You took it. Sister, I hear something. Grey women, Perseus said confidently, throwing the eyeball up and down. My name is Perseus, son of Zeus and Danae. It is I that took your eyeball away. The grey women lurched towards Perseus with their withered grey arms. Give it back, evil boy. You play with our precious eye like a child's toy. Spit it out, be quick, tell us what you want. We'll give you anything, just return it at once. I must bring my king Medusa's head, the gorgon who only sees men who are dead. The nymphs of the north have the gifts that I need. Tell me how to find them and I'll return it, guaranteed. The grey women didn't hesitate, and as promised, quickly told Perseus the directions to the nymphs of the north. Perseus was surprised at how simple his first task had been. He dropped the eyeball back into the hand of the oldest grey woman and left their freezing cave for the sunny lands of the nymphs of the north. The Grey Women had told Perseus that the nymphs had lived in the land of the Hyperboreans, which legend said could not be reached by land or sea. However, with Hermes and Athena by his side, and the Grey Women's secret directions, Perseus reached the mysterious land with ease. He found the nymphs of the north dancing in the midst of an enormous feast, with lyre music and laughter filling the room with the happiness the Hyperboreans were famous for. The Hyperboreans immediately welcomed Perseus to their feast. After Perseus had eaten his fill and danced merrily with the beautiful nymphs, they paused to bring him the gifts he needed. The nymphs emerged holding the three gifts. They stepped forward and passed Perseus the gifts one by one. Perseus, our future hero, We present you three gifts. First, a pair of sandals that will let you fly swift over land and sea away from the sister's wrath. Next, a silver bag that fits anything with ease. Into this, thrust Medusa's head with speed. Lastly, and most importantly of all, Hades' cap of darkness taken from the underworld. With this, you will be invisible. None shall behold you. 
farewell and good fortune, handsome son of Zeus. Hermes reappeared by Perseus's side and clapped his hands. Well done, half brother. Honestly, I wasn't sure you'd get here, but you did. Well done. Just one more thing to reveal. Here is my sword. It will pierce anything, even Gorgon skin. Fly straight southeast and you'll find the Gorgon's lair. Just remember what Athena said. Don't look at her hair. Farewell for now, young Perseus. Soon you'll be back with your mother. Perseus strapped on his winged sandals, put on Hades' helmet, slung the bag over his shoulder, held on tightly to Athena's shield, and brandished Hermes' heavy sword. He was ready to complete his quest. The wings on his sandals began to flap, and Perseus began to soar above the clouds. Throughout his flight over the sea, Perseus wondered how he would know which was the island of the Gorgons. It turned out it wouldn't be that difficult for him. As he flew towards the island, he peered down and saw a sight that made him feel queasy. The island was littered with stone statues of people, some old, worn and weather-beaten, some brand new and exquisitely detailed. There were just a few on the island's beaches, but they started to grow thicker and faster the further he flew towards the centre of the little island. As Perseus looked down at the stone statues, which were now falling in mounds, he realised just in time that he needed to shut his eyes tight. With his heart beating in his throat, he pulled out Athena's polished shield and held it above his head. Perseus timidly opened his eyes and looked into the reflection. Right below him were the three Gorgon sisters. They were truly terrifying, with scaly bodies, enormous wings, and of course, mounds of slithering snakes for hair. However, only one had a human face. Perseus knew that this must be Medusa. Perseus was confused why the three monsters were so still. He flew down just a little bit closer and squinted at the reflection. Perseus couldn't believe his luck. The Gorgons were asleep. This was the best opportunity he was ever going to have to fulfill his destiny. Hardly daring to breathe, Perseus flew down to hover just above the sleeping Medusa, with his eyes glued to Athena's shield. At this distance, he could see Medusa's famously beautiful face reflected in the shield, surrounded by the terrifying snakes. Perseus lifted Hermes' heavy sword above Medusa's throat and suddenly felt that he was not alone. Athena was beside him with her hand on Hermes' sword. He heard her stern voice in his head. Now, Perseus. With Athena's guidance, Perseus sliced right through Medusa's neck. He was so fast that Medusa did not make a sound, but her eyes were wide with surprise. With eyes still fixed on Athena's polished shield, Perseus grabbed at the mass of snakes and quickly shoved the head in the nymph's magical bag, shutting it tightly. With eyes shut, Perseus flew up and away from the island as fast as his winged shoes could carry him. If he had looked down, he would have seen that from Medusa's body emerged a magnificent winged horse named Pegasus, and a spectacular warrior holding a golden sword called Chryseor. The other Gorgons awoke and screeched at the sight of Medusa's body, but Perseus was safe and high above the clouds. He wore Hades' cap of darkness, and they could not see him. It was time for Perseus to return to Seraphos with his prize. As he flew home, passing the barren Ethiopian coastline, he heard the bitter cries of a young girl. What person could be out alone in such a desolate place? He travelled closer to the source of the cries and saw that they came from a young woman chained to a rocky ledge by the sea. Perseus instantly flew to the young woman's side. He fell in love with her sweet face at first sight. The young woman did not seem to notice him. Perseus realised he was still invisible and took off Hades' cap. Who are you and why are you here? She stopped weeping in astonishment. I am Andromeda, the princess of Ethiopia. My lands have been cursed. My mother Cassiopeia boasted that her beauty was greater than the gods. Since then, we have been terrorized by a monster, 
Hundreds of our people have been slaughtered. But the oracle said, if they sacrificed me, the sneeze snake would leave us alone in peace. Leave now, young hero. Save yourself and flee. Perseus smiled. I will try to defeat the serpent to set you free. If I do, will you do the honor of marrying me? Compared to the Gorgons, defeating the sea snake was like defeating a mouse for Perseus, who still had all of his magnificent gifts from the gods. He unchained Andromeda and waited with her on the rock, where they chatted and laughed for hours. And when the enormous sea snake finally rose above the sea, ready to devour its sacrifice, Perseus sliced through its body like butter. Now joined by Andromeda, Perseus flew home as fast as he could to Seraphos, and burst into the little fisherman's house he had grown up in, delighted he could finally see his mother, Dictus, and Clymene again. But upon opening the door, Perseus found the house empty. Perseus's stomach dropped. He ran to his nearest neighbours to ask what had happened to his mother and adopted grandparents. After Perseus had left Seraphos, Polydectes had ordered Danae to be his wife. When Danae refused, he continued to pursue her so ruthlessly that Danae and Dictus were forced to take refuge in a temple where Polydectes could not touch them. Perseus was filled with rage, hearing about the hardships his mother and Dictus had faced at the hands of Polydectes. He finally realized that Polydectes had asked for Medusa's head to keep him away from his mother and the island. However, his neighbors had also told him that Polydectes was holding a banquet with his most loyal supporters in the palace. Perseus could end Polydectes' reign of terror once and for all. Armed with only his magic bag, Perseus marched to the palace of Seraphos, leaving Andromeda at the little house. Reaching the doors of the great hall, Perseus thrust one hand into his silver bag and felt for the snakes still slithering inside the bag. With the other hand, he pushed the doors open as hard as he could. Every man's head turned to the door with surprise. Purse! Polydectes began to boom. But Polydectes never finished his sentence. Perseus shut his eyes as tightly as he could, pulled out Medusa's grotesque head and thrust it towards the jeering crowd. Once the room was absolutely silent, Perseus put the head back in the bag and gingerly opened his eyes to see a room full of perfect, life-size statues. Polydectes sat on his throne with the half-formed word on his lips. Perseus ran to the temple and finally reunited with Danae and Dictus, telling them about his incredible journey to defeat Medusa. The islanders were overjoyed that they were finally free of Polydectes. Perseus decided that Dictus was the most worthy man to be the king of Seraphos, and he was beloved by the people of the island forever. But what happened to Perseus's grandfather, King Acrisius? Perseus and Danae decided to travel back home to see if they could reconcile with King Acrisius and claim Perseus's birthright to the rich Argolid kingdom. However, when they arrived at the palace, they found that King Acrisius had travelled to an athletic contest north of the city. Perseus decided that he would take part in the contests himself and try to win over his grandfather. As Perseus lined up for the discus competition, King Acrisius sat in the spectator's area and began to admire the athletic and strong boy. However, with horror, he quickly realised that this boy was the grandson he had thrown out to sea. But before King Acrisius could escape the crowd, Perseus threw his discus so badly off course that it hurtled towards the spectators through the crowd and directly into King Acrisius' head. Just as the Oracle of Delphi had predicted, King Acrisius had been murdered by his own grandson. Perseus was so ashamed to have killed his grandfather that he swapped his inherited kingdom of Argos with the kingdom of Tyrans and ruled there instead. With this decision, the troubles of Perseus, Andromeda, and Danae were finally over. The three lived happily together in Tyrans for the rest of their days. Perseus gladly gave the head of Medusa to Athena, who bore it on her polished shield forevermore. One day, Perseus and Andromeda's great-grandson would become the greatest hero the Greeks had ever seen, the half-god, half-man, Heracles. 
But that is a story for another day. Thank you for listening to Mini Myths from Athena to Zeus. If you like today's podcast, you can subscribe for future episodes or share this one with friends. You can also follow the Hellenic Museum on social media or pay us a visit here in Melbourne. Tune in next week for the story of Theseus and the Minotaur. Yasas for now. This podcast was recorded on Wurundjeri land. We pay our respects to their elders past and present. This episode was performed by Aaron James, written by Natasha Marinopoulos, with sound design and mix by Greek Media Group. The Hellenic Museum thanks you for bringing this story to life.